People have arguments such as the risk of dying from coronavirus 19 is smaller than the risk of X or Y, say getting hit by a car, okay? Say you say, oh, the risk of getting hit by a car is more than the uh, dying from the coronavirus. And let's assume you're right and that is correct. Even then, that doesn't diminish the downstream consequences of the decision to ignore or not proactively act. Why? Because one is systemic, relating to a whole system, and one is idiosync idiosyncratic, which relates to a finite limited number of assets. If I don't act against my own probabilistic interests, I will be helping COVID spread and other people will get sick, die, and that will put further pressure on, on the economy and the medical system. And that is by Nassim Talib, an amazing thinker, mathematician, uh, expert on probability. You'd always rather be blamed for overreacting and underreacting in situations like this because the consequences for underreacting are far greater and far more dire than the consequences for overreacting. So really important, if I don't act against my probabilistic interests, I will be helping coronavirus spread. That is the camp you're in if you decide to do nothing. And we're going to talk about further on how the actually that will happen, how the spreadability is why it's high and how that is actually happening. Some important questions to ask that we all must ask immediately. Number one, and Peter Atiyah helped provoke these thoughts. Dr. Peter Atiyah, an amazing doctor I recommend to all of you. Well, number one, are you in an area where there is a community outbreak? Well, with over 120 plus countries now, as of March 15th, when this is being recorded, you need to ask yourself, are you in an area where there is a community outbreak? What does area mean? It depends how you define it. Your area could be your county, your suburb, or your city. I classify my area as my city of Melbourne. Number two, are you an individual who is at risk or lives in close proximity to someone at risk? High risk, classified as 55 to 60 plus, and or has comorbidities. Comorbidities, for those who don't understand, example would be diabetes, obesity, age, smoking, history of cardiovascular or respiratory uh, disease, or high blood pressure. These are examples of comorbidities. Comorbidities, these illnesses then increase your risk of dying from another illness. In this context, the virus. So, if you can answer no to both questions, you are in a better situation to most. But the personal decision remains to avoid your large group social distancing and maintain meticulous hygiene, to avoid spreading to others in your community, which can have significant downstream consequences to the optimal level depending on what mentality is taken pardon me which can have significant consequences at the optional level depending on what mentality is taken so but if you answered yes you have to make the cost benefit analysis either social isolation needs to be seriously considered and implemented or you play the odds and potentially put many others at risk everybody has and i said this from the start to people close to me everybody has a different risk analysis of how they assess risk. But it is a point now, and that what many people earlier on, months ago, were saying, that erring on the side of caution is usually always better because the potential risk far outweighs uh, the cost of isolating yourself or doing the action that is going to be proactive. And if you're going to make mistakes, which we all will, you're better at making mistakes on the side of precaution than on making mistakes on the side of lack of precaution. The consequences are much more dire and severe on lack of precaution. And we see the latter often with how people live their unhealthy lives. They wait until something bad happens to them. They think they're living a healthy lifestyle or they're doing things that aren't going to help them and are going to harm them in the future. So we're trying to frame the conversation here, and it's, this is just be, this is well beyond how you respond to a coronavirus. This is how you respond to life, okay? Precaution, it's like proactivity or reactivity. Are we going to wait for the injury to happen in a person, or are we going to do things to mitigate it? Oh, there, that's why we exercise, to mitigate disease, to mitigate injury. There is almost no advantage to being a late mover. So why wait? Because right now we're living, and previously, this is especially more evident that people are divided between pro-panic and pro-nonchalance. One group's panic seems to be driving another's nonchalance and vice versa. 
The pro-panic faction, while perhaps not entirely justified, is far less of a public health risk than the pro-nonchalance faction. The later you panic, the less effective you will be, and the more you put others at risk. And people have this stigma around panic. And we're going to talk about the implications of stress and cortisol on the immune system. Panic. If that means you do something like basic emergency stocking up that we all should have anyway, is that really panicking? There are so many reasons we all should all have 14 days of, of food, water, supplies, have the ability to have electricity and gas and supply ourselves if anything happens, um, like services go down. That in of itself has nothing to do with the coronavirus, but, but things like this teach us the effectiveness and the lesson of planning because anything can happen. It is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. This could be a terrorist attack. This could be a biological threat, man-made or not. Suffering, catastrophe and pain and unfortunate circumstances are coming. You're probably better off. No, no, not probably. You are better off to prepare for those. So the folks accused of panicking, are the people taking it too seriously? Is actually still the nonchalant who will panic eventually because they are totally unprepared. It's the classic ant and grasshopper dynamics. That is from Navar Ravikon. Is panic really worse than neglect and carelessness during an epidemic of this sort? Those who panicked early don't have to panic today. Nasim Talib. And what we're seeing is a lot of people are suffering for something called normalcy bias. And I have, earlier on you saw this. It's a tendency for people to believe that things will always function the way they normally have functioned and therefore underestimate both the likelihood of a disaster and its possible effects. People go about their lives living under, this, under the normalcy bias when their loved ones are parents, family members who are doing potentially things that could harm their health. They don't consider the consequences of them and that they could be ill and die from them at any moment. Normalcy bias is expressed itself also just with everybody, all your friends and all your family, everybody you know will eventually die. And we have this tendency to assume and subconsciously assume that everything will remain the same and it will be fine. While we still know at the back of our mind that we see suffering catastrophe all around us, but no, it can't happen to us. And so normalcy bias is especially relevant here, especially earlier on in the January, February months of 2020, when people downplayed the potential ramifications of this virus, even though we saw very clearly the implications in China and the consequences there. Not taking risks one doesn't understand is often the best form of risk management. Another analogy I like to frame the conversation with is that we put on our seatbelt to protect us for when an accident happens. We don't expect to get in an accident today, but we protect ourselves and prepare anyway for the eventual couple times in our life that it will, it will eventually occur. So, the, what's the seatbelt? The seatbelt is the preparation. The seatbelt is, well, it was, and still is for some people, four weeks worth of food, water, cleaning equipment that you can clean your environment with for you and your family. I live in a country where we have a lot of bushfires, or also known as wildfires, most people weren't prepared for the devastating wildfires that we had in our country just in late 2019, early 2020. They weren't prepared. They didn't have masks because then we had terrible, terrible air quality that, was, that peaked into the, into the worst in the world often. And there are going to be a lot of downs, there are a lot of consequences of this on respiratory function and all cause mortality. We weren't prepared. Even city folk, people who live far, who live far away, were prepared when their city was covered in, in, in smog and the air was now polluted. Put your seatbelt on and prepare and diversify your sources of information, like I said earlier, and be suspicious of stories because there's panic. There's the panic, everyone's not going to be okay story, and then there's the everything is going to be fine story. And the, probably the truth is somewhere in the middle, and that is what I'm trying to pass out today. Fatalism and inaction. Perhaps due to these challenges, a common public health response is fatalistic, accepting that what will happen because of a belief that nothing can be done. This fatalistic, nihilistic idea that, well, it's all, it's all gone to shit now, nothing can be done. You see people 
there are people out there there's there's videos and content out there of people in china and in america and all around the world minority though that are who are sick and who are purposefully sharing their sickness with other people coughing on things purposely sharing their poor bacteria coughing on things t- like t- touching saliva putting it on something it's like well if everyone's going down you're all going if i'm going down you're all going down with me and this response is incorrect as the leverage of correctly selected extraordinary interventions can be very high the leverage of correctly selected extraordinary interventions can be very high and that expresses itself in the in the face of social isolation hygiene getting things delivered to you understanding that uv light can be effective for mitigating or shortening the lifespan of a virus on a surface We must remember we are only here because our grandparents and ancestors prepared ahead of times of stress and hardship. They put away food and planned against potential misfortune. Why don't you think you should do the same? Why do you think you are immune to this? This is a summary by Nasim Talib. Multi-scale population approaches, including drastically pruning contact networks, using collective boundaries and social behavior change, and community self-monitoring are essential. Together, these observations lead to the necessity of precautionary approach to current and potential pandemic outbreaks that must include constraining mobility patterns in early stages of an outbreak, especially when little is known about the true parameters of the pathogen. You see, there were experts out there warning against this that we must constrain our mobility patterns in the early stages of an outbreak, especially when little is known. Because when little is known, we are ignorant and we can get caught off guard very easily. And that is what is happening all around the world right now. You see, regardless of whatever happens with COVID, it is not about so much what is happening now. It is about the future of what worse things can happen and will happen. This is the lesson. And some argue that we should have learned 10 years ago with SARS, or rather 20 years ago with SARS, and 10 years ago with MERS. Well, here's another wake-up call. So, it will cost something to reduce mobility in the short term, but to, to fail to do so will eventually cost everything. If not from this event, then one in the future. Outbreaks are inevitable, but an appropriately precautionary response can mitigate systemic risk to the global, the globe at large. But policy and decision makers must act swiftly and avoid the fallacy that to have an appropriate respect for uncertainty uncertainty in the face of possible irreversible catastrophe amounts to paranoia. So he's saying that we must avoid the fallacy that to associate paranoia with proactive early decision making or the converse belief that nothing can be done. So, and uh, I'm going to quote a really important analogy that Tim Ferriss made that like we all have a fire extinguisher in our home, right? We all have a fire extinguisher. Would you accept a hundred dollars to get rid of it? What about a thousand? Probably not. I wouldn't. As unlikely as a kitchen fire might be, as unlikely as you dying from the coronavirus or you being infected by it, depending on your area, the extreme known consequences of an out of control fire are easily justifiable to have a fire extinguisher. So what's the correlation to that? What's what's the analogy to that? What's that analogous to? Well, the fire the, the fire could represent a big community outbreak, like Italy's saying. They didn't pull out that fire extinguisher early enough. The fire extinguisher could be like in Wuhan. They're wet markets causing, contributing to viral outbreaks that this is not the first time it's happened to. And we're going to talk about the origins a bit later. The fire for you could be you and your family getting sick. And maybe one of them has some comorbidities and over 60 and one of them gets seriously ill. And for one of you listening, you're going to know someone who's going to die. At least one of you will. Even though some folks thinks, think uh, of me, think of me or let's say people think of you as a risk taker. It's about a, being a risk mitigator. You're putting on your seatbelt. It's easy to mitigate a lot of the downside risk until the data paints a clear picture. And sometimes when you wait for the data to paint a clear picture, it's too late. 
Panic rarely creates a proper response to anything. Some say. If you are healthy, have a solid immune system, not within the age risk, and use basic precautions, you're probably going to be fine. You're probably going to be fine. Like we know 80% of the cases experience mild to moderate symptoms. But that doesn't take into consideration older populations who are at higher risk. Some of our colleagues who are infected also have infected relatives, and some of their relatives are already struggling between life and death. So be patient. You can't go to the theater or the museums or the gym. Try to have pity on the myriad of old people you could exterminate. We all know and have... We all know people who are 60 plus with comorbidities in our life. We all, if we don't have a grandparent, we know someone who does close to us. So it, it, while it may not be able to relate to you directly, it can and likely will via proxy of someone you know. And then, and only then, will you likely really care. But maybe this can provide some framework on why you should now.